So, um, let's see some examples of this, uh, of, of, of this kind of dynamics. So the first model, the original model for, for collapse models, is the Girardi-Rimini-Weber model, or GRW. Okay, the, uh, the idea is simple. So we want a uh, localization in position. Why? We do measurement in positions. So we want that something that my cat is actually localized in position. I'm localized in position, for example. So localizations in position. And these are done with some kind of statistic. This will be the Poissonian one at rate lambda. Then I have the actual localization of my state. So the state psi will go after localization. to something of this sort. OK, so I apply an operator L on Psi, and then I just renormalize my state. So the, how do I choose the point A at which it's centered? Because this is a, OK, so Li is a Gaussian in position centered at the value A, which is chosen randomly. So this is the stochastic part. RC is the width of my Gaussian. And this is just normalized. OK. And then the nonlinear part comes in the renormalization of my wave function. OK. So I have both my, my uh, features of collapse models here. And then the probabilities of having the particle i collapsed in the position a are just given by that norm squared. OK? Then between a collapse and the other one, I have just the, my standard Schrodinger equation. So in a timeline, I have Schrodinger equation, a collapse, Schrodinger equation, another collapse, Schrodinger equation, and so on. And the rate of this, you have these collapses, is determined by the Poissonian statistics. OK? OK, which are the effects of, of this kind of model? So consider, for example, a superposition. So this is the, the model squared of the psi. This is x. A superposition, half in minus a, half in a. Two Gaussians, OK? So the effect of this kind of dynamics, centered, for example, in A, is to have, let's see, the application of a Gaussian. This is the GRW Gaussian. OK. Then I remultiply everything. And what happens is that at the effective level, this part of the superposition becomes smaller. This part of the superposition becomes larger. And so I have more probabilities of finding my system in A than in minus A. Easy. Simple. OK. So then there is also something also important here, which also solves our first question. Why we don't have macroscopic? systems in superposition. OK. So for example, if I take two particles centered both in a superposition, centered minus A and A, OK, then what happens to the center of mass? 
So one can show that if I apply the same GRW Gaussian, in that case, my system will collapse twice as strongly in A than, than before. So the center of mass now will be going like here and twice as huge. Okay? So bigger is the system, stronger will be the collapse of my wave function. Then this naturally comes out that macroscopic systems are actually localized faster than microscopic ones. Okay? And so this is the so-called amplification mechanism. And this amplification mechanism, again, solves the, the problem of having uh, macroscopic systems, of not having macroscopic system in a superposition. Okay. So, in some way, the Gerard Yermini Weber, the GRW model, is uh, uh, some sort of uh, toy model of a more complex one. And this is the CS, so called CSL model. The continuous uh, spontaneous localization model. And I, I will give you the, um, yeah, the equation for the psi of this model. And this reads in this way. So we have the Hamiltonian, so the Schrodinger part. We have the nonlinear part. So this is the expectation value of this operator M performed on the state Psi. The stochastic part. And we have here a white noise acting on every point in space and time. Okay? This noise here is defined in this way. X t of y is white. So the expectation value of this noise gives a dt and a Dirac delta in space. Okay? Then now the definition of this guy here, m is uh, a is a Gaussian, at the end of the day, of this form here. So we have this operator is a smeared mass density. I'm counting how many particles I have in Y. Then I smear it with the smearing center in X. I'm just waiting with the mass of the particle. OK? Nice. So this equation here has a, uh, the same structure as, as those uh, we saw before. But it has also a nice, uh, another a nice feature, which is written, uh, written in terms of uh, creation and helation operators in the second quantized uh, um, formalism. So what happens here is that we still we have also the preservation of the symmetries of identical particles, which is also something that we want from some universal theory. Okay, so we are even more happy here. Okay, so. And now, 
that's the nice part, so it's my, also my work. This model here is described in terms of two parameters, lambda and uh, RC, okay? So these are two phenomenological parameters, and one has to guess the numbers for these two values, for these two parameters, uh, to actually solve all the problems, no? So actually say, okay, my experiment, I cannot have a superposition that large or with that big mass. So there are some proposed values. For example, Girardi, Rimini, Weber proposed lambda, 10 to minus 17 seconds minus one, and RC, 10 to minus seven meters. And this is actually consistent with saying, okay, I cannot have this lambda too small because otherwise uh, my chair will be in a, can, can be in a superposition. So macroscopic systems need to be killed. And with a, how, how, how do I describe this dimension? No? So how fast and how big should be my system? So how fast should be my collapse? How big should be my system? So this is the idea uh, behind that numbers. Okay, and then one can also think, okay, how, how do I test this, this kind of, of models? So, because still, this is all theory, but then we, have, we need to go to the lab and to see and if this is consistent, this theory is consistent with, with our experiments, so with what we see every day in, in, in the lab. So, um, let me start here. So the first kind of, of experiment uh, one can think about are the most natural one, superpositions. I make a superposition and I just see for how long this remains a superposition. So these are the interferometric tests. So, for example, I do my max zender interferometer, and at the end of it, I just measure the interference fringes. Okay, so what quantum theory says is that I would see something of this sort. Okay, but then what happens is that I have noises, I have uh, disturbances, I, my laser is not perfect, my measurement is not perfect, my, I don't know. What actually I see is something more of this sort, okay? So at the end, I have a contrast of these interference fringes, which is reduced. So now, could it be this just the effect of my collapse models? Because actually, this is what uh, my collapse models predict, a reduction of the interference fringes. So my system is not in a superposition, it's just here or there, okay? And so this is actually, uh, so this is, uh, this is quantum mechanics, and this instead is quantum mechanics plus collapse models. Okay, and actually the, the effect of uh, the collapse on my system can be described in, term, in these terms. Okay, where gamma So the fact is that if the distance between x and y, uh, x and x prime, 
is bigger than RC, then this is zero, this is one, and so the effect will be strong. If instead my distance is smaller, then this is almost one, so one minus one is zero, and so I don't have any effect. Then I obviously need to add here um, H bar. The Schrodinger part. Okay? So the action of, of, of my collapse is to kill the superpositions which are which are uh, at a distance larger than RC. So RC is describing how much I can, uh, how, how, how big superposition can stay in my, in, in my experiment. Larger, I just kill it. Okay, so this kind of, of experiments are actually interesting. And uh, I will try to, to give you an idea of, of this parameter space here. Let's see. So this is uh, log lambda. This will be log RC. Just put some, some numbers. So 10 minus 20. 10 minus uh, 2. Here we start from 10 minus 10. So this is and 1. This is in meters. This is in seconds minus 1. So, for example, the GRW values are somewhere here. 10 minus 7. 10 minus, so more down, 10 minus 17. Okay? So, because of the same idea, two big particles should collapse really strongly, there is a theoretical lower bound here, uh, which is more or less going in this direction. Okay? 10 minus 10. So everything which is so, below this line can, cannot, cannot actually describe uh, the fact that at the macroscopic level I don't have superpositions. Then I do this kind of experiments. And I see that at 10 minus 4, there's this. Uh, experiment uh, much more here of making this uh, few years ago they make with single uh, atoms a superposition of half a meter okay so it's more or less half a meter and this is the bound so all these values of lambda rc are actually excluded by this experiment then Another experiment is done with something really similar to this one. So again, a superposition of macroscopic, of, of uh, sorry, of macromolecules. So of masses 10 to the fourth mu. Okay? And the bound, more or less, is of this shape. 10 minus 6. Well, there's still quite a big region that should be explored here. And uh, what actually we did was to consider not just this direct effect of, uh, of collapse models, but also indirect ones. So what, what do we have here? is uh, at the end of the day a stochastic modification. Yes, it's nonlinear, but it's also stochastic. So the nonlinearity makes the collapse, 
the stochasticity makes some noise. So what happens is that I can, I can actually describe my, 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 my old dynamics in terms of uh, stochastic potential. which is of this form here. So this is the same operator as before, and then I have a white noise here. Or if you prefer, respect to the one before, this was it. Okay? So I just adding a stochastic potential, but this means that I can also obtain a, a stochastic force from it, no? Uh, I V C S I no from the Schrodinger uh, from the Eisenberg equations. Okay, so I have a noise and this noise is kicking my my system, my particle, and so can actually the first thing is okay. Uh, look, I start with a particle of momentum uh, K I. Okay, then my my noise is kicking in, so this is CSL noise, and so my particle, at the end my particle will have some, some other uh, momentum, okay? Okay, but I, I can describe this, this kind of system, I know how to, how to do that, no? So for example, a, a thing that I, I, I can see is how the energy of my system changes. And Okay, then I, I just sum over all possible initial states, of, over all the possible final states, and I have um, how, how do you do? the statistics of my kind of particles, fermions, our bosons. Then I have my transition energy, so this is the difference between the final and the initial energy of, of my system, and then I just compute the, the probability of having this transition. And this probability, I know I can compute it in terms of the standard perturbation theory. start from the initial state, I make it evolve as for the Schrodinger equation, I kick my particle, then I have still some evolution, and I, I consider which is the projector on, on my final state. I just integrate in time, and so this is the amplitude, this is the amplitude of this transition. And so I get my, my evolution of the energy. And what happens is that you do all this uh, computation, and you get that this actually gets a really nice and simple equation. But what is important is that it doesn't depend on the statistic of my system, on all the form of my system. It depends just on the mass, on this rate lambda, on the values of Rc squared. But what is really nice is that it's growing linearly in time. So, if I just leave there a particle, a free particle, then the energy of my particle, the total energy of my particle, will just grow due to this CSL mechanism. And so this is kind of something that I can actually measure. For example, uh, okay, obviously there are dissipations, there are other kind of emissions, but okay, consider, for example, um, a star, okay, and as, let's assume that this star here is actually heated only by this kind of process. So everything, that the energy that is uh, flowing in is due to CSL. 
Instead, whatever is flowing out is due to radiation. So this is something that I can measure. This is the black body radiation of a, of a, uh, of a star, for example. No? So I measure this. And so from this, I say, OK, look, the system is actually in equilibrium. So I have that all the energy coming out due to radiation is actually coming in due to CSL. And so I can put a bound on the values of lambda and RC. And surprisingly, I get a bound which is really strong. It's something of this sort. Wow. It's kind of surprising that I did a lot of tests. I make really big superposition or with quite big particles. Then with just a single observation, I just uh, rule out all this part of this parameter space. Wow. So maybe I should consider more carefully this kind of systems, this kind of tests. So maybe this noise is really, can be really strong or we are actually really good at measuring it. Okay. Um, so I have still 20 minutes, so I will go with uh, our last example. And this is uh, the optomechanics. So yesterday, yesterday we, we already saw something. No? What is optomechanics? What is, which, which is the idea behind that? So briefly, what we have here is a, a fixed mirror a movable mirror, okay? There is some light here. But the system is, uh, is a little bit more complex. This is an upper system. We have the laser also. So this is the, uh, so this is the spring. This is the laser. which is pumping my cavity. My system here will oscillate, but then we have also uh, that on this, we have dissipations on, on my system. We have some noises, effectively noise. Then we have that the cavity is also leaking energy. But now what we do is just to add an extra noise. Okay, we just add here CSL. So this is the idea. Now, we are really good at, at measuring all, all these objects here, or we can try to uh, push some of the parameters in such a way that we, we do that. And then wh why shouldn't we just test CSL also in this, in this way? And in particular, uh, I will write it here. So I can, uh, don't worry, erase the graph. In particular, okay, yesterday we saw uh, the master equation formalism. Now I will give you uh, the uh, quantum Langevin equations for describing the system. So um, it's the mass. And then we have the equation for the field in the cavity. Okay. So the idea is that the one of, of yesterday, no? We have the, our, uh, our harmonic oscillator here, which is coupled 
through some light. We have dissipation, we have noises due to the environment, and then we just add the stochastic force due to CSL. And the field is described as an harmonic oscillator, it's coupling with the position of, of our mechanical resonator, clicking because the cavity is not perfect. And then we have also some noises due to the input laser, which is pumping our system. Okay, so the idea is that uh, we just uh, construct from here, we solve this kind of, of problem, we linearize it as we did it yesterday, so we can solve it in an easy way. And this is done, okay, the linearization part exactly as we saw yesterday. So in particular, we take the uh, cavity operator and say this is just equal to, to this, where alpha is much bigger than one, okay? And so we can neglect some terms, this quadratic terms in a, a tilde, and so we solve this. And then a trick is that all these operators here depend on time, and so we can just describe them in the Fourier space. Mm, let's call it in this way, okay? So this is, will be the operator in the Fourier space. But in this way, all the derivatives are just uh, i omega times the operator. And so uh, we simplify this problem. We can solve it. And then at the end, we define the DNS. The density noise spectrum. And this is the, um, the autocorrelation of, of, of the position in the Fourier space. X prime omega, X prime omega. Okay? So I want to see how far two frequencies are correlated. So how, which is the correlation among two frequencies, two, uh, the position at two different frequencies. Okay, so this is all standard treatment of optomechanics. So what I get at the end of the day just uh, to have an idea of get something of this sort. So we have three contributions to this uh, signal, and this is what, something that we can actually measure in the lab. The first contribution is due to the laser. So this is the noise, describes the noise due to the laser. Okay. Then we have a contribution due to the environment. And finally, we have a contribution due to uh, collapse models. In particular, okay, here, This guy here, which appears everywhere, is something of this sort. It's just a Laurentian, okay? Centered in, uh, uh, in omega zero, almost, because there are some uh, modification due to the presence of the laser. And there is the gamma, so the dissipation. So the idea is that I will get something of this sort, 
okay? Then we have S of CSL, which um, put it here. I, don't, I really don't want to raise uh, the picture here. So if I do the measurement along the x-axis, what I get is that CSS, CSL is of this form, where I have an integral in k in the momentum. This is the Fourier transform of the mass density of my system. And there is the smearing that becomes a Gaussian uh, minus k squares, rc squared. Okay? And this actually quant quantifies which is this, the, the action of my CSL on, 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 on my system. Okay, and this is what something that we, we can actually uh, measure in the experiment. So, which, which is the, the idea? The idea is that, um, let me see. Okay, the simplest way to see which is the, uh, the modification of, uh, of CSL. So, take for example the, the term of due to the environment, no? So, we have something, we have this. Okay, this guy here, no omega missing there, yeah, some omega missing here. So, this guy here, in the limit of uh, high temperatures, and we already saw yesterday, that is always the case in, in the experiments, this becomes, uh, so, T much bigger, so, Actually, it's KBT much bigger than H bar omega. This becomes something of, uh, of this sort. Can be approximated to this. So, which means 2 gamma KBT. Okay? Then I just multiply by the mass, I divide it by the mass. And this is the mass which is missing between the two terms, okay? And so you can see that if I take again the, the last line of that, now I get something of this form, okay? Then if the if gamma is actually fixed, the effect of uh, CSL is to change the, temp the effective temperature of my system. So this, uh, where is it? This is equal, I don't know if you, but I, I revert here. temperature of my system is equal to that of the environment plus something else. So if I can measure this something else or the error on this measurement will actually describe, will actually give me which is the uh, bound of my collapse parameters. Okay, and we have, so there, there are a lot of, of experiments doing, doing this. Uh, for example, I can just cool down a uh, cantilever with a small ball. There is a squid on it measuring how this ball jiggles. And so we can measure the effective temperature of the center of mass of this system. 
and uh, the bound goes something of this form. Then there are there were two actually two experiments here, no, which are centered on the dimension of of my sphere. Then another really uh, strong bound was given by um, LIGO. So you you all know LIGO. So this is the measurement of uh, the, the experiment measuring the uh, gravitational waves. So I don't have any other nice color. No? You know it? Yes? Okay. The idea there is always we have a cavity, two mirrors, then there are other, actually other two mirrors here. There's a long distance, kilometer distance between this. And uh, and you do interference between the light going here and going there. These two are fixed. These two can move. Okay? So if a gravitational wave passes in one of the two directions, then you have that the, uh, the light here is not, uh, will, uh, the contrast will be different between the one arm and the other one. But that really doesn't matter for us. What we are interested in is the noise which is acting on this on the, these masses, which I want to point out these are 40 kilogram masses, so they are huge. But this system here actually puts a bound which is of this sort. So this is all the part of the uh, collapse parameters which is ruled out with LIGO. And then there is also another, uh, and this is the last one, experiment we considered, and this is Lisa Pathfinder. Lisa Pathfinder is, uh, is also a, a really nice experiment. So there is this proposal of, of doing a, a, an experiment for measuring gravitational waves in space by using free satellites, okay? So it's the same idea as there. And uh, link it by some light, and then you measure the relative distance between these free satellites. Obviously, this is something um, extremely expensive. So before sending up free satellites, they sent just one. And this is Lisa Pathfinder. In the satellite, one has two masses, and the distance between these two masses is just measured. And these are one kilogram masses. Then, so you have the two masses, and the nice part is that these two masses are in free fall in space. Okay, and this is the, the, the nice part, because there's actually nothing which is touching them. So all the seismic noises, all the uh, electric noises, everything in what, that you have actually in, in your lab in ground, you don't, in this experiment, so you don't have it. And this is why this experiment here is placing a bound which is more or less here. So this is also ruled out. And this is more or less the state of art of uh, the collapse model testing uh, up to now. You have questions, I suppose, a lot, or none. That's ruled out, yes. So this part here. Yes, these are still non un unexplored uh, values of these uh, parameters, lambda RC. So, that's the possibility, one have to test, that one of these values here is actually describes collapse models. Yes, yes, exactly. That, and, and the challenge now, also you, if you have an experiment or you think that an experiment can be, can be useful to, to test that, is to go 
are, are as down as possible with these lines, with these uh, upper bounds. Okay, no questions. Well, then I think uh, I will stop here. Thank you very much, and see you tomorrow morning.